Welcome to my raised bed vegetable garden. Now I've grown vegetables for many years almost strictly in raised beds. And at my last house, it was basically out of necessity because we didn't have any sun in any spot where we had open ground or existing flower beds. And so I had to get creative with this 20 by 20 square foot cement slab that was pretty much the only sun that we had. So I built 15 inch tall raised beds on top of the existing concrete. It would have taken a lot of backbreaking work and a lot of money to have it hauled away. So you can grow vegetables over soil in a raised bed, over concrete in a raised bed, or over contaminated soil, as long as you put a solid bottom on there of some kind of food safe plastic. But I do have several videos on how to build these type of raised beds and how to build the raised beds like I had at my old house. And that'll get into all of that information. I'll leave those links down below in the video description. While those videos will tell you how to construct your raised beds, this video is more about what you need to think of before even starting the construction of your raised beds. And then what are some common pitfalls that people make after having the raised beds and starting to grow in them? The first thing you wanna get right is the location of your raised beds. Crops that you're going to grow love full sun, thrive in full sun, which means six to eight hours of direct sunlight every day. Now those six to eight hours could be broken up. Maybe you have a tree somewhere that shades your garden in the middle of the day, but they get three or four hours in the morning and three or four hours in the evening. That works too. And typically what full sun requires is a south facing location if you're in the Northern hemisphere. So right over there is south. So this garden gets bathed in full sun every day, all year. If you're in the Southern hemisphere, obviously you want a north facing garden. You also wanna position your vegetable garden near the house, the kitchen preferably. Now, right here, we have our Mediterranean herb garden, and then the vegetable garden is just right there. Another important thing to have is a water source semi nearby so that you don't, you're not dragging hoses or watering cans or buckets across your property to try to get there. But having your garden near the house is going to allow you to just run out there really quick when you need herbs or a quick vegetable, some lettuce for dinner or whatever you're making. If it's hundreds of feet away from your house or on the opposite side of your property, you may not want to make that trek. When it comes to building the actual beds, uh, a lot of times people make the mistake of making them too wide. My favorite width for a bed is four feet, and that allows me to reach into the center from either side. It makes it much more comfortable. You don't have to get in your beds, which is another mistake we'll talk about in a minute. I also like eight foot long beds. That allows you to make a bed with three pieces of wood. By three eight foot pieces of wood, cut one of them in half or have someone at the uh, hardware store do it for you. And then when you put them together, you have no waste. It saves money, it saves time, and it's just a really good bed size for many reasons. You also wanna consider the width of your path. And you have to think about that when thinking about the overall space you have and then the width of your beds. I like my paths to be at least two feet wide. These are a little bit more than two feet wide, but it allows me room to kneel between the beds comfortably to do any work that I need to do. If you have any disabilities, you're in a wheelchair, you wanna work out the corners of the paths because you wanna be able to maneuver through the beds easily. The next mistake sometimes people make is not building your beds high enough. And that all depends on your comfort level and what the substrate is that you're growing on top of. Now at my last house, those beds were 15 inches high because I was growing on top of concrete. So the bottom of the bed is literally the bottom of the roots. So most vegetables need at least 12 inches of root run for them to grow properly. Now, when I built the majority of the beds here in this garden, uh, they were six inches tall. And you can do that if you have good soil or decent soil underneath them that isn't contaminated, that uh, doesn't have a lot of perennial weeds. Even though the bed is raised six inches off the ground, there's still plenty of root run they can have on deeper into the soil. However, here we have a, a gopher problem. And so all of these beds on the bottom are 
basically edge to edge stapled in gopher wire. Uh, 16 gauge galvanized hardware cloth. So if you have gophers, that could be a solution for you because we have, last year I had a gopher in here trying to get into these beds and he was going around and around them and could never get in. So it definitely works. It holds up for about 10 years. Chicken wire is too big and it doesn't hold up very long. The problem I had with these six inch beds for certain things is if you want to grow root crops that are long, like long carrots or parsnips, uh, you can't because they'll be stopped. Well, if you don't have a gopher issue, you can, but if you have to have gopher wire on the bottom, then those large roots can't get through that gopher wire. So I have to grow short carrots, which is fine. The other problem is when you're making a TP for beans or ha having to pound posts in for something, you can't pound it past the gopher wire. So in the three new beds I built here, I actually built them twice as tall. These are made out of two by sixes, same here, just two stacked on the top, which gives me a 12 inch deep bed here. And what's great about these simple framed beds is you can expand or grow them taller if you need to. So probably over the next few years, I'll slowly add height to all of these beds, just like I did with this one. And all you have to do is get a four by four or another piece of two by four in each corner, drill them into the bottom. So they're standing straight up and then build the top frame around. That just gives some corner support and keeps the top frame from moving off of the bottom frame. Now, obviously as we get older or you have disability and have a problem bending, or if you're in a wheelchair, you wanna bring it up to the height that you're comfortable with. So you can use actually bigger boards. You can use two by 12s, maybe two or three of those on top of each other. Now, what about the material you make your beds out of? Well, it can be made out of almost anything. Uh, first of all, it can be made out of nothing. If budget is an issue, uh, you can build up a six inch mound of good compost and just plant directly into that. You don't need edges. If you're going to go with edges though, uh, the cheapest would be wood, but what kind of wood? I'm using Douglas fir here. It's a relatively cheaper option of wood. Doesn't last quite as long as a more expensive option like redwood or cedar. Those are definitely great choices as well. Uh, they will cost a little bit more, but they will last quite a bit longer. What you wanna stay away from is uh, compressed or treated wood that would last a long time, but at the expense of safety. They're not as dangerous as they used to be when they were soaked in arsenic. However, they are soaked in a, a substance called copper azole. And there is some scientific evidence that shows that it can leach out of the wood and into the soil. Whether it leaches into your plants or not, I don't know but I would rather be safe than sorry. I'm growing organically here, so I know what's in my vegetables and that puts up a question where maybe I don't. So I will have to replace these every several years, maybe every five to seven years, but it's also cheaper than the treated ones. So to me, it's a good trade-off. These two beds here are made out of fabric. The company that made these is Grassroots. Now, the great thing about fabric beds is they will root prune. So as the roots touch the edge of the container or raised bed, instead of wrapping themselves around like you'll see in a, a root bound plant, they actually stop growth at when they reach the oxygen they're getting through this fabric. And then they put the energy back into the root to shove out a bunch of side roots. That's going to make the plants more robust. So fabric beds are great. I grew peanuts and sweet potatoes in these last year. They did great. And the last choice is metal raised beds. And those are great as well. A lot of those come in really good heights, so you don't have to bend over so much. So anything you wanna use that's safe will be effective and will work for your raised bed garden. The next thing you wanna think about is what you're gonna fill your bed with. And that would be the next mistake, is choosing the wrong soil. And really, any soil is the wrong soil. We're growing in raised beds because they have a lot of benefits, but especially because of the good drainage that you have and the light fluffy texture of the, the mix that's put in here. Uh, you can just dig your hands down in here like you would never be able to do in the ground. And so you never want to use garden soil to fill your beds with. Garden soil is easily compactable. Even if you don't walk in your beds, garden soil can compact just with watering, especially if you have a dense soil like clay, 
or even if you have a really free draining sandy soil, that's going to be really too much drainage. You'll never be able to keep moisture in here. Uh, but even a good loamy soil is still not going to allow the bed to breathe the way it would with uh, a raised bed mix or a potting soil. That's where you're going to get the advantages of raised bed growing. The downside of that is that is where 90% of your cost in raised bed gardening will be, and that is what you fill it with. So you can get some great bulk options like mushroom compost. If you look locally for a mushroom farm, uh, they're willing to usually offload a lot of the used compost at a really good price. They might even offer delivery. Um, something that I've used for many, many years is available, I think nationwide at least, possibly not out of the country, but Kellogg's uh, Organic Raised Bed Garden Mix. And I've found that to be a really great option. Unfortunately, one of the things we do have to worry about as home gardeners is the Grazon issue. If you don't know what that is, Grazon is a herbicide that is used uh, in agriculture. And a lot of times what happens is that's either taken like hay that is sprayed with it. Uh, that will be composted down and sold as garden soil or an amendment or even manure if cows or horses eat that hay that is contaminated with grazon, they poop it out, it's composted, and then it's sold to you. The grazon, no matter how it gets into your garden, can stay there for up to three years. And so you either, either have to wait three years to be able to plant, or you have to take it all out and start again. So you really need to be careful on where you source your filling material. Like I said, that is the main cost of a raised bed is what you fill it with. So if you are building a bed that's two feet or three feet high, I mean, the cost could be astronomical. So there are ways to fill those beds that are taller with uh, something that's a little less expensive. Now, if you've got a six inch or a 12 inch raised bed, it needs to be full compost, full potty mix, full whatever you're using, it needs to be all of that. However, if you go up two feet or three feet, you can put in any type of organic material, and I'm not necessarily talking about organic like no chemicals, I'm talking about anything that will rot down. So if it's a three foot tall bed, the bottom of that bed can be filled with logs and large branches. And then the second foot could be filled with twigs, leaves, hay, whatever smaller uh, material that's gonna break down quicker can be that level. And then the next level, uh, the next level would be, or the, or the top level would be your good compost, potting soil, raised bed mix. What's gonna happen is over the years, all that lower material is gonna break down. Your entire bed is going to be full of good, rich uh, compost. But in the meantime, that top 12 inches is really where most of the roots hang out. So they're gonna be good to go until that bottom layer does uh, break down. Another mistake a lot of gardeners make is not refreshing the soil that's in your bed either once or twice a year. Now you're gonna notice at the end of the season, the soil level is gonna be a lot lower than when you started. Now that could be for a few different reasons. That could be uh, erosion, settling, other reasons that aren't explained and we're not supposed to ask, but it is kind of a mystery where all that goes. And so every year in the spring and again in fall, now I do it in both times of year because here in our climate, we can grow through the winter. If you can only grow you know, spring and summer where you live, then amending it just once in the spring uh, is great or once in the fall, either way works. And you just wanna add another two to three inches of good compost or soil mix to your bed. Now, not only will this, you know, keep the, uh, the root run as deep as it should be, but it also, all of the, the microbes and the worms that are in your beds already are going to use that new soil to reinvigorate themselves, reinvigorate the entire bed to be ready to produce more crops the next year. It's also going to uh, lessen the need for crop rotation. A lot of times in the soil are the, the bad bugs, the bad microbes, that will come back out if you plant the same thing the following year, and they will be usually splashed up onto the plant. So the, all those microorganisms, those bacteria, you water, it, it hits that old soil that was there last year, it bounces them up to the leaves, 
and then they take hold and they start to infest your plants. Putting a physical barrier of two to three inches of compost over that is just like a blanket. So watering will hit that new compost and it won't have uh, as much of a chance of spoiling your crop as if you didn't do that. While we're still talking about soil, uh, the next mistake a lot of people make is actually walking in their beds. You don't want to do that because you don't want to take away the airiness of the soil or the, the mix. And so when you're walking on it, you are compressing all of that life. You're compressing the roots of the plants. Uh, you're also pushing the soil down where it's going to take more soil to fill it up at the end of the year or the beginning of next. And while we're on this subject, and it probably could be another mistake, uh, is I don't do any tilling or digging. In a raised bed, you don't have to do that. You don't want to disrupt the soil life. You don't want to bring seeds and bad microbes from down below and turn them up where they're now on top, exposed to either the light and more water for uh, them to grow if they're weed seeds, or bringing them to the top to be able to splash up on your plants if it's diseased. So no walking and no tilling, which is why four feet wide where you can reach into the center of the bed is a good idea. The next mistake a lot of people make is not mulching your beds. Mulching it has so many benefits. Um, Number one, like I said before, with adding compost, it just is a physical barrier between the bad stuff that's hiding in your soil and your plants. The second reason to mulch is to cut down on weeds. If weed seeds can't germinate because they don't have the light, uh, they won't germinate. And so you won't have to be fighting weeds all summer long. Another reason is to keep the moisture in the soil. I water with drip, and if that is covered up, it never sees the light of day. So instead of half of it evaporating before it even touches the soil or right from that top inch of the soil, it is able to soak in deeply. The sun is also not baking the top of the ground. So when you dig this, uh, uh, this mulch up, you're going to see that the top of the soil is moist. Where there is no mulch, the top of the soil is not moist. So it's going to save you money on your water bill. And if you water by hand, it's going to save you a lot of time. And then the last reason for mulch is because this mulch breaks down and is taken into the soil by the worms and the soil life to, again, enrich the soil and reinvigorate it. Now, what can you use for mulch? Well, just about anything that will break down. Now, I'm trying something new this year. I'm using pine shavings. I have used uh, hay or straw in the past, and... That is a, it's a good thing to use. It does create some weeds. Whatever that straw was made out of will start to sprout, but it's rooted in the actual straw. So it pulls out very easily. It's not a problem in my opinion. The problem is my fear of grazon contamination in straw, in hay that is grown. If you don't know where you're getting it from, you it's a lot of times can't, can't even ask if it has been sprayed with grazon. So if you know where you're getting it from and you can ask that and they can tell you, Straw is a great, a great choice, um, but wood chips, wood shavings, those are a great choice because they don't have any grazon used on, you know, trees like that. Uh, you could also use leaves. You could use grass clippings, although if you do, I would keep it to a very, very thin layer because they tend to stick together and make this carpet, this mat that the water has a hard time getting through. You also don't want to dig the mulch, especially like wood shavings, straw, you know, bigger, bigger things, uh, wood chips for sure. You don't want to dig that into the soil. So if you're going to be planting, you want to move that completely aside and then plant in the soil and then bury the seed or whatever, or the plant, and then put the mulch back. If this gets buried in the soil, it robs the soil of nitrogen because it takes nitrogen to break this down. And that is nitrogen that your plants cannot use. So on top of the ground is good, mixed into the ground, not good. Number 10 is winter protection. Now, a lot of gardeners skip this because in the fall, you're kind of tired and burnt out after a long summer, and you just feel like I'll deal with this in the spring. And that is a big, big mistake. If you have cold, icy winters, you need to protect the soil. Even if you just have rainy winters, you need to protect against erosion. 
And so there's lots of ways to do it. Do that. Mulching actually is one of them. Um, I'm going to put a link to a video in the description that I did last fall about how um, I winterized my beds both for uh, icy cold winter climates and mild climates like I have here. But you can use mulching, you can use cover crops. Um, cover crops is basically sowing something. Now in an icy winter climate, you would want to use like winter rye or something like that that, that can handle the cold. And uh, crimson clover is another one, hairy vetch. Crimson clover, you know, a lot of these things people think about as weeds because you have clover growing, you have rye grass in your lawn. Why would you specifically intentionally put that in your bed? Well, they're not going to make weeds if you treat them right. And the way to treat them right when you're doing a cover crop is to sow the seed, let it grow. And if you live in a winter climate that freezes it, it's going to kill it anyway. So, the, but the roots are still down there, keeping the soil intact, keeping it from erosion. Um, and then it's also giving uh, material, decaying material for the soil life to eat over the winter. If you live in a mild winter climate, then you can let that grow until it's starting to bloom. And then as soon as it's starting to bloom, you cut it back to ground level. That will kill it. It will also stop it from spreading its seed and making uh, an ongoing problem of weeds. So if I counted correctly, that is 10 mistakes that you might make when growing in raised beds. If you learned something, please give the video a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Share it with a gardening friend, and I'll see you next time.